welcome to the Nest Podcast, your home for nerd entertainment and sports talk, where your hosts, Brandon and Zach, hash out what's happening in video games and sports every week. Enjoy the show. What's up and welcome to a special episode of the Nest Podcast. This is going to be the... Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood discussion episode with our good buddy, Chad. Uh, I'm your host, Brandon. Joining me as always, co-host Zach. And of course, Chad. What's up, dude? Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me back. I had a good time the last time. Yeah, Yeah. long-time listeners will remember Chad from the the Taran tournament that we had back, (laughs) oh, I don't know, months ago, where we ranked out the eight at that time Quentin Tarantino films and rated them and well well, and then and and then ranked them and argued their way to the finality with Pulp Fiction coming out on top as the uh the greatest Tarantino film possibly at that time. Do we think that Once Upon a Time of Hollywood rivals that? I don't know. We'll get into it. Um first off you know, guys, going into the movie, what was your expectation? Uh, I thought I knew what it was going to be, and then it be- became something different. But I was just ready to watch a Quentin Tarantino movie. I don't, I, I didn't really go into it with like, it's going to be like this and like that. The only thing I uh, thought it was going to be that it wasn't was more of the Charles Manson story. I thought it was going to be almost a retelling of that. And it obviously wasn't, so. Yeah, I think uh, typical Tarantino f- ideas or uh, fans or whatnot would think that's the route he's going with this. That's why he chose this specific period in time and this, uh, the, you know, the proximity story of of what he chose, you know, beside the Tate living beside the main character's house and all that stuff. I fully expected it was going to be centered around the Manson family as well, but I, I was pleasantly surprised with some of the best acting that I've seen in fucking forever. <laughs> Chad, what did you expect going in? Did you expect it to be kind of this uh, uh, glorious telling of a story, or did you kind of expect the macabre? Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't really know. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I tried to stay away from any kind of reviews or any kind of spoilers. Um, Also, that being said, let's take a second to uh, because I feel like there were a lot of punches that I pulled in the last one that we talked about where I didn't want to like give certain things away. So, uh, spoiler warning: Mm -hmm. if you want to not have the movie spoiled for you, you can stop listening like in the next thirty seconds. Also, not safe for work. Uh, I'm gonna. Probably. <laughs> I've Pro- yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> hey, sure. It says explicit on iTunes and most other podcast platforms when they download it. Okay. If they listen at work, then that's their own fucking fault. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or alert. Cool. <laughs> Nest fucking podcast. All right. So, so yeah, spoiler alert. Good call on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't really know, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I, th- I think I caught a little bit of, um, uh, like a, a little snip of a Joe Rogan podcast that we'll talk about later. And, um, I, I heard a little bit about one of the scenes and then, um, just from the previews, just from the cast that we had initially talked about, I was like, cool, they're going to dig into the manson murders somehow tie that in with two actors of some I, okay cool and i just kind of left it at that so having super i watched the, the the trailer maybe two three times um tried to stay away from it i didn't want to like it dissect it or analyze it and ruin it for myself so i just tried to go in with no expectations just knowing that it was a quentin tarantino movie and see what it was like um pleasantly surprised because I, I i expected there to be a little more charles manson um and and digging into that and it was more about 
what went on around Charles Manson instead of just focusing on him, which was a, a new dynamic. I, I thought it was I, I thought it was fresh for the for the take on it. Yeah, it's it it ended up being brilliant by Quentin Tarantino, and you know you you hit the nail on the head. He kept an old story fresh, mm -hmm. and we didn't we didn't just see the uh, the brutality of the the Manson murders or anything like that. But every time the Manson family was on the screen, you had this feeling as a a, a watcher as a, a viewer that the shit was about to hit the fan. Mm -hmm. I, I, even in like the happy cheery scenes with the hippies <laughs> and all that stuff, I felt like, Oh shit, something's about to get fucked up. Like it's the Mansons. They're about to go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Even when she's off, like when she offers him a blowjob, I'm like, what you should probably say no to that. <laughs> she's going to bite his dick off or something. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like, Oh no, no, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I think they had a creepy vibe, especially in their little compound that they had mm -hmm. taken over. Man, they were they are some strange folks. Like especially the scene where uh, Brad Pitt's character's tire gets slashed. I mm -hmm. was like, they're gonna fucking kill this dude right here. <laughs> Which, yeah, I'm gonna slash your tire until you get the fuck out of here. Makes no sense. <laughs> fucking hippies. <laughs> their skills of deduction aren't that astute. <laughs> I mean, unless they were like, well, if he can't drive, he's going to leave his car here. He'll walk away and then we'll just fix the car and have a new car. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, maybe, I guess. I'm just talking out loud at this point. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I, I love how, um, I mean, let's, let's be real. They couldn't name it the adventures of Cliff Booth, but they should have. <laughs> I would totally sign up for a Cliff Booth. Man, spinoff series of this, hundred percent. It and I've seen I've seen enough Quentin Tarantino movies to say that like I I called a lot of things that were that were coming, um, but I was wrong in so many ways. I was like, this that's one hundred percent going to happen. That's it. It, it didn't happen. That's one hundred. It that didn't. Ha so I I kept on getting thrown off. So. I, I feel like I got a, a good grip on how he writes or, or how he puts the story together. And, um, you know, I expected him to pull out the jack, jack up the car and do it just out of spite, you know. But I didn't expect him to just beat the dog shit out of that guy and then be like, you're fixing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or the um, or shit, the, the ending um, that went completely different than how I expected. We can save that for later on in the conversation if you want to. Yeah, let's let's kind of build our way up to it um and kind of kind of take our listeners whether they've watched the movie or not. Maybe they're listening to us talk about the movie and that's going to be the determining factor. Are they going to waste 2 hours and 45 minutes of their <laughs> lives watching yep. a movie? And I think, yeah, definitively, I think that they should and that, that hopefully we're going to guide them in that direction. So, um, but the movie kind of takes you through the ebb and flows of Hollywood careers, it seems, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Uh, what was his name? Fucking Rick fucking Dolan. Rick, Rick Dolan. I, I was like, <laughs> I wanted to call him Clint, but I was like, no, it's Clint Booth. Yeah. Um, Obviously, we all need to watch the movie multiple times because two hours and 45 minutes is a lot to digest in one viewing. Yeah. But, yeah, Rick Dalton, he's a celebrity. He, he's basically John fucking Wayne. He, he's a Western icon at the end of his rope. Pun intended. Yeah. And he's he's intersected with young brilliant talent that uh the little girl actor emma whatever her last name is um the little girl on set mm -hmm. she he inter he he has dialogue with her that kind of she's at the beginning of her career he's at the end of his career i love the story that he tells her about easy breezy basically telling her his life story lays it all out and she's like, well, what's going to happen with easy breezy, you know? <laughs> and, and I like how it was left kind of 
that conversation was kind of left the way it was because Easy Breezy was left to kind of write his own story from then on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I kind of akin that little piece to being very Tarantino esque in his own regard, whether he wants to go on and continue making films after this one. But that's a whole other conversation, you know? Because this, this uh, would be a great capstone for a career, I think. But. I think he's got one more in him that's going to have a lot more shock and awe. And then it's not going to be Star Trek. Oh, fucking A. If, that, <laughs> if that's the 10th film. I don't I'd, want it to be. You know? I don't want it to be. Yeah. No, I don't either. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, you're right. The, the Going through, I mean, I've never been an actor in Hollywood. I never really spent any more time than just driving through to know what it's like for, for life there. But I think that, um, you know, he, he lived there for a substantial, um, I mean, he didn't, you know, he, I don't think he lived there during that time. I, I don't know. I, he was probably in Tennessee still, but everything that he has absorbed from that era just came out in, in this movie. I, I expected it to be more about Manson and, less about all of the people that had cameos or or that had representation in it um but the people that he had to do um cuz he used he used some some real shows some real movies some real actors some real uh, there there was representation of I, I, most of the stuff that he was doing for like Steve McQueen, Bruce Lee, people like that, they were, those were real shows that he was talking about in that. Um, but all the stuff like Rick Dalton is so they had changed the name on a lot of them. Um, the movies, of course, most of those were fake, but, uh, well, you mean the, the gringo to the lingo was a <laughs> real movie. <laughs> Is that what it was? It's, uh, it's something about something, uh, something stupid. <laughs> yeah, uh, correct. Yeah, you got it. Um, but man, uh, it, it was just like this historical vomit that Quentin Tarantino did, and all of it, like from Timothy Oliphant's character to whoever the hell played Bruce Lee to uh, Damian Lewis at nailing uh, Steve McQueen, like. Pfft. Man. What a crazy cameo that was. I know, man. I I I love everything that Damian Lewis has done because he he's such a strain his stoic stuff, his just really obscure stoic stuff is great. And he played he plays Steve McQueen. Man. It was it was it was really cool because that whole scene where Steve McQueen gives that little monologue about uh, what's going on was basically unnecessary but the fact that it was in there was like yeah really cool it really set the tone like 1960s hollywood this is where we're at and it was just that's like so tarantino is to just throw some shit in there that's like yeah sure steve mcqueen isn't a part of this movie but here he is and here's his monologue <laughs> <laughs> right I, I bet damian lewis probably said i need a certain number of lines <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm only going to do it if I have a certain... Uh, hold on, how many does Timothy Alphon have? Mm. <laughs> I'm going to need a good you know, good I, quarter I, of that or something. What's the fucking runtime of this motherfucker? Yeah, I'm taking it, a little right. s- little sliver of that pie. Yeah, yeah, I need three and a half minutes. Maybe even <laughs> both. <laughs> and I don't mind it. And, you know, that's one thing that is brilliant about the movie is we've alluded to how long it is. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's a almost three hour movie. It it holds your attention. I didn't sit there and look at my watch and be like, Oh God, what time is, is it? You know, fuck I'm yeah. getting bored. No, like when it ended, I was like, shit, shit. Holy fuck. <laughs> like, of course the last 15 minutes are holy fuck, holy fuck. And I mean, to me, it kind of ends on a cliffhanger. I could see I could see a once upon a time in Hollywood too. Yeah. Like maybe it, it's it, not it, finished. It maybe it the could. story's not finished. It could, but going into um <clears throat> the rest of his yeah, yeah. M- mm, maybe. He, he could <laughs> maybe. Well, I mean, just think about it. Like now now 
our boy Leo's acting career is saved. He's met uh, Roman Polanski, mm-hmm. and he's going to be able to uh, ex- ex- extend his career, I guess, through those kind of movies. Maybe Rick Booth, Brad Pitt's character, goes on a vigilante mission with his dog Brandy to hunt down the fucking Manson family for sending those goons to his house. So you get him and let's see, let's let's have him team up with somebody. I don't know, fucking Kirk Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> that won't happen. He thinks he's creepy. Yeah, well well. <laughs> it would be badass to see those two That's... just go slay Mansons. Yeah. Kirk uh, Douglas from uh from Death Proof and oh wait, he's de- never mind. Yeah. Another yeah. spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I don't know. It would be great. I, I think they could definitely continue the story. And then that way Tarantino does in a way get to go out on his little love letter to Hollywood. But he also gets to go out with the bang that Tarantino's known for. Mm-hmm. We saw, you know, the 15 minutes of that at the end of the movie when Brad Pitt smokes the acid dip cigarette and all hell breaks loose. But we, I think, I think exploring the Mansons and all that stuff with all of the, the brutal nature of just the subject matter, I think it's something that only Tarantino could really go further with. Tarantino doesn't strike me as a sequel kind of guy. Kill Bill? <laughs> yeah, that's all one movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that's what this would be, too. It would just be a second segment of this movie. Yeah, maybe. A continuation of this story. You can't, I, you can't say that he... Well, okay, maybe not the same characters, but there's like this... Two or three degree separation, uh, similar to Kevin Bacon or whatever. The the thing where half of the people have the last names of half of the people in either Pulp Fiction, Inglorious Bastards, or uh, it, 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 name it. You know, the, the, the Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. yeah they, so there's like different generations of like I think yep. um, like Tim Roth's character in Hateful Eight is related uh to is related to Michael Fassbender's character in Inglorious Bastards. Right, yeah. And Vega the yeah, Quentin yeah. Tarantino <laughs> universe, man. <laughs> it's, oh. Someone someone said the uh the TCU, uh the Tarantino cinematic universe. <laughs> I mean I, I once prefer, you've done I prefer films, QTU. Yeah. <laughs> QTU. Quentin Tarantino universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Zach. I don't think there's going to be, I don't, know, I don't know. There may not be enough for an, a sequel. He, he put a lot into two hours and 45 minutes, man. That. Right. Plus I think he, he has, he, he likes to tell different stories. I don't think he likes to do the same shit. His, his, all of his movies are about different shit. Like he doesn't do, a movie about this and then the movie about kind of the same thing. Like he's done one world war two movie, you know? So I think he likes to tell different stories. I don't think he likes to keep re- reiterating the same shit. Well then by that logic, he would go and do star Trek next because that would be his futuristic <laughs> spacey movie. Womp womp. Maybe it's a retelling of star Trek. <laughs> Uh, what we're gonna get Quentin Tarantino directs Galaxy Quest or some shit? <laughs> be Slamming aliens' heads and uh, metal grates and shit. Call up <laughs> Tim Allen, get him back on board with some shit. <laughs> Ugh. No, but um, what what are some of the memorable scenes in Once Upon a Time of Hollywood that kind of stand out? That you know when we think of Tarantino movies, we have classic scenes that jump out from all the movies, you know, the, the Joker to the left of me or clowns to the right of me, Joker's to the left scene in reservoir dogs that jumps off the screen. You remember that scene, the, the big kahuna burger scene from Pulp Fiction. You remember that scene. Uh, what are some of those scenes from once upon a time 
that that jumped out to you? Chad, go ahead and start. Oh wow. Not to put me on the spot or anything. Okay. Um, Zach, if you have one. No, I mean I'm ready, but uh I was I was wanting Zach to go first. I feel like I keep on uh talking over Zach, so Zach, there go, go ahead. I, I I shall. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I have a list. I have prepared it. <laughs> The first one that stuck out to me, and this might be just me, but is is when Cliff is leaving Rick's house and he's in his little beater car and he's whipping down the Hollywood Hills. Just that scene of him driving was really intriguing for me for some reason. And then he gets to his little shack and I thought he was pulling up to this uh, drive in to watch some movie or something. And he fucking has this little nasty trailer that he lives in. And you get to see his dog and his uh, his relationship with his dog. That scene for me was the first one. Was like, okay, this is this is what Cliff's life is, and that 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 one was just interesting for me. Yeah, he goes from the glitz and glamour of driving around, you know, let's face it, his boss's car, and then he he gets into his shit whole life. Yeah, yeah. You know? But it, it is it is interesting because you realize then that he's this roughneck character. Mm-hmm. He's not about the the Hollywood socialite scene, and he's more of the grizzled vet. Yeah, yeah, he's balls deep in in Hollywood lifestyle, but yet he's so far removed from it. Mm. And I his dog is badass. That's probably an accurate depiction of how all of those stunt guys were, right? Like they ninety percent of people in Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, you've got your you got your big names, and then you've got your your guys that that are uh, battered and bruised and and hardened because of the shit that they do. That the pretty people or the import the money makers rather um, don't. Uh, not not that they don't want to do it. I mean, shit. Most of the time, the studios are saying, "No, you're not. You you're not jumping off of a fucking building." Right. Um, you Jackie Chan being an, an extreme uh, exception to the rule because he's like, "I'm not doing the movie if I can't do that shit." You know. Tom but, Cruise the same way. Oh really? Yeah, Tom Cruise does his own stunts. It's like if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna break my foot and shit. No. Yeah. Uh, um, the power of Scientology can tell you. <laughs> I didn't want to take it that far, but yeah, that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that most of those, most of those stunt guys, uh, the people that do all the shit that really amps people up, you know, that are like, oh, explosions, Michael Bay, pee on things, those guys, like those, <laughs> <laughs> those guys do the shit that most people want to see or are going to the movie for that. And they live in fucking uh, in one bedroom apartments uh, or studio apartments in where, you know, wherever they can uh, close enough to whatever sets that they can still make their living or a fucking RV in the middle of uh, what looked to be a construction site. Yeah. Yeah. Accurate depiction. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's very possible that that could have been Tarantino's life before Pulp Fiction. He put everything he had into that movie. And if that movie wouldn't have been a success, I don't think Tarantino would have been a success. For he sure. could have he could have fizzled out right there. But it was a success. And now Tarantino movies are almost like events. You know, um we, we all saw it in theater. I think Zach, you saw this was your first Tarantino film in theater, right? Yep. I, I if if listeners remember, Chad saw pulp fiction in theater. Hmm. So <laughs> as a as a smart dogs i'm not that old i mean i'm old but i'm not that old you you were still pretty young whenever you saw it in theaters oh, way yeah, yeah. All right. way I, not I, old I enough blamed uh i i haven't heard that one but i think i blamed my a lot of my childhood or a lot of my my humor and my oh, shit a lot of ugh, my acceptance of the what would what would come of the next few years based on how Pulp Fiction kind of broke me in because man, if you don't know a lot of what's going on in society or what's going on. Yeah. Pulp Fiction will that baptize you. (laughs) We will teach you about some shit. (laughs) And I feel like this movie for what it's worth can kind of do the same thing. It kind of transcends and teaches you little lessons throughout. 
I, I get I really did get the whole vibe that uh this is Tarantino's expose. This is him coming out. Cliff Booth and Rick Dalton are him in a nutshell. Yeah, kinda. That's that's how and I feel like he kind of maybe Tarantino lived in a shithole and then he ended up living in a nice house beside rich people. Right. I, I mean, we, I don't know his what his address stories like where he lived in Hollywood whenever he was writing these movies was like or whatever. But I, I feel like he put a lot of himself in those two characters. I think it's two things. I think this was his homage to 1960s Hollywood. And he was, you know, foreshadowing like on the underbelly kind of telling some stuff that was more personal to him. Right. You can feel that, like especially like you said, when Rick Dalton is is telling the little girl the story of that book that he's reading. That is where I felt it the most. <laughs> Man, I, I feel I feel like I I dug into the Charles Manson murders and and stuff like that so much uh, for um, Brandon. You'll remember old the, the old band that um. Ah, the old band that I was in back in 2009 uh, when I was writing about serial killers, I dug into a lot of stuff about Charles Manson and I never looked at the world around what was going on then. All I looked at was, was their stuff. Um, and, and this was pretty much everything else uh, around that. And it, it starts to, to make sense to go from, 10 years ago when I was messing around with that stuff to, to see, um, and accurate, not accurate, fictional fan, whatever it may be. This is a clear depiction of why the things that they did or why they felt justified about doing what they were doing, you know? And, and, um, it, it was, I, I knew nothing basically it's <laughs> how I walked out of there feeling. I was like, I, I know all about the Manson stuff. So by all means, you know, show me what you got. And they just tiptoed around a lot of Manson. I mean, you only saw Manson for 30 fuck, seconds, a minute, tops, yeah. you know, and, and when he was on screen, I, I take that back when he was on screen or when anyone from the family was on screen you felt that same tension from like inglorious bastards um maybe not from the like dairy farm scene but you definitely felt some of that same tension from uh what's the scene of uh i like like the the basement bar scene you felt some of that same tension that's exactly what i was gonna say right there uh when when you when it's revealed that the Nazi's sitting on the other side of the wall, yeah. listening to the whole conversation transpire. Yeah. yeah. That, that tension is there. And it, that's what I was alluding to earlier. Every time that the Manson family was on screen, you thought shit was going to pop off. Yeah. Like, whenever Cliff was out at the, the Manson family, uh, studio or whatever, the spawn ranch. And he insisted on meeting the old guy. I thought they were going to kill him. I yeah, thought, sure. oh, shit, we're going to see some... We, we're going to see Brad Pitt get destroyed right now. <laughs> I don't think we saw enough of Cliff's interaction with just normal people at that point to know that he would fight a group of 30 people. Like, weapons or not, he would just be like, sure, let's let's do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I like... mean... He, we're talking about a guy that stepped up to fight Bruce Lee. So I guess, <laughs> right. you know, yep. he's like, I'm coming in and, and taps on the mesh and he's like, that's not going to stop me. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> but I mean, you know, who in the 1960s would stand toe to toe to Bruce Lee? Yeah, Pro- probably not many people. So the fact that he would you know, obviously fictional character and all, but mm-hmm. he, he went toe to toe with Bruce Lee and fought him to a draw pretty much. Um, we'll have to yeah. go back to Zach's Badass. grocery list of, of scenes since you're bringing it up. Um, that's, that's definitely my first, um, just how, like, I've always, I've always seen videos of Bruce Lee and, you know, when video, when, when Bruce Lee is on, uh, 
when he's on film, when, when he knows that he's speaking and it's being recorded, he's a completely different person than who he is when he's just walking from his car that he parks a mile away to the set. You know, he, he's just he's a different person. Wouldn't you say that's probably true of most entertainers? Of course. Of course. Okay. But everyone, um, the, the segment that I was talking about with Joe Rogan, um, he was a little upset with how they portrayed him and how they made him look like he was pompous and arrogant and he was a jerk and and his daughter was upset about how he was portrayed in it. Give me a fucking break. That guy, uh, Zach, you were about to say something? No, no, go ahead. I was no. just... Yeah, that guy, like, he, I believe that he was talented. I believe that he could beat the shit out of a lot of people. But I, I think that a lot of it was very much uh, dancing, smoke and mirrors. You know, that anybody can beat anybody up in a choreographed fight. Um, he was talented in a lot of parlor tricks. With like, what? what's the video that goes around with him? <laughs> I, I'm sure it's fake. The the one where he's using nunchucks and playing ping pong with it. Yeah, you all seen that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it's fake. I'm sure it is. There's, I, I don't believe there. There is not a doubt in my mind that that's fake. But Even if just, it's real, he spent six months practicing that mm. to figure out how to do it. You know, it's not like he just picked up nunchucks one day and was like, "Oh, hey, look at this! I can hit a ping pong ball. <laughs> that's neat." Right. Yeah. Like that's something you have to practice for sure. Use it, use it in a fight, Kato. Right. <laughs> Kato. Kept calling him Kato from the Green Lantern. Yeah, that was a nice little little reference right there. Um, that that kind of cracked me up that that he was provoking him. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm talking about Cliff Cliff Booth. He was provoking him, calling him Kato, <laughs> and kind of getting under his skin a little bit. And uh, it that that was one of the top scenes in the movie for me. Um, I liked that Bruce Lee was kind of pompous and arrogant because I feel like that's probably how he was in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely, you know, you know, like you, you were alluding to it earlier, you know, he was very aware when he was on camera and when he was off camera. Mm -hmm. And if he's, if he's getting challenged, anybody that's in like the fighting world, if they're getting challenged, the machismo is going to step in and they're, they're going to be like, what the fuck you saying? <laughs> You want to fight? All right, motherfucker, let's fight. You know, so I I don't doubt one bit that he really would have been. Somebody would have. Uh, another memorable scene for me is when Leo gets to deliver his uh, kind of ransom kidnap monologue. Oh, man. <laughs> man. I, like the, the little girl says, you know, pretty much all that we need to say. And that's the best acting I've ever seen because mm -hmm. he killed it. Mm -hmm. I think Leo likes playing in Tarantino movies because he gets to play crazy people. Yeah. He gets to play the just wild characters sometimes. You know, uh, he got to play the, the racist plantation owner in Django. And he nailed that line, uh, Mr. Candy at Candyland. He killed that shit. So he likes playing these off the wall roles. Uh, he's he's our generation's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, I, I feel like that role for for Leo probably was exceptionally difficult because he's playing an actor that's hmm. playing a character, and you know how like that's got to be a strange dynamic where he was you know he his his character was fucking up lines, and and getting frustrated and stuff. And that's man, that's a very in, intricate. Uh, character that he had to play it just hit me the only way that he could play an actor playing a character playing an actor playing a character is if he were in the movie inception which he fucking was <laughs> well, that's that's how tarantino pulled it off <laughs> yeah he fucking figured it out yeah, yeah. i think I, I think yeah zach i 100 percent agree that's uh and brandon as well those those are um those scenes even when like he's legit pissed off at himself for fucking up lines um, and how he deals with it. That's probably how he deals with it in his own trailer. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Like, just mic me. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll show you exactly what happens. Yeah. I love the scene when, when Rick goes back to his trailer and is just pissed off at the world and ready to kill himself. <laughs> and just he's like, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to drink. Fuck, I, I need a drink. <laughs> yeah. Reaches right for it immediately. <laughs> you don't even like whiskey sour. Yeah. So did you have um, eight last night? <laughs> eight. <laughs> One, two, three, but I, not eight. That that was one of my favorite things is because I I love whiskey sour. That's kind of my go to drink when I'm. I know you're who out, I thought about when sipping. I saw yep. that. <laughs> so whenever he's ordered whiskey sour, I was like, my man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was that place uh, in Knoxville? I think it was Chad that we got the the whiskey sours. It was like that little library or something. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's the one at the b- bottom of the Oliver Hotel. The Peter Curran Library. Yes, that's it. That was a fantastic little uh, speakeasy type place to go and get good quality drinks if you're in the yeah. Knoxville area. That was back when it was weird to pay twelve dollars for a drink. Now I'm, I'd be happy to pay twelve dollars for a drink in Nashville. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Pricey living out there. Uh, that's why I mean, you drink at home. Yes. Hang out with you guys. See your pretty faces and drink bourbon at home. Mm-hmm. See, for for those listeners out there that want to start a podcast, this is one of the, the good things about it. It's kind of like sitting down at a bar with your buddies, just having a sip of alcohol and shooting the shit about the movies. Yep. <laughs> Zach, you were going to say something? I feel like the whiskey sour is a, is a hit or miss drink. Like a place either makes a good one or they make a dog shit whiskey sour. Well, they either make a good one or they use the uh, the sweet and, sweet and sour <laughs> mix from fucking abc store down the street yep. if they use that pre-packaged shit then you know it's going to be a bad whiskey sour yep. if they actually hand do it then you're in for a good night right but anyway i like that they had their uh, specified drinks what was the other one a bloody mary is that yeah was that what, Loved yeah. him a bloody mary have you ever had a bloody mary i've never had one yeah i mean they yeah. good you like tomato juice? Nah, not really. No, you don't like tomatoes. That's why you don't. You you never fucked with Bloody Marys. No, um, would not like it then. Yeah, they, I, I hear it's kind of like an alcoholic V eight. Yep, that's a good yeah. way to describe it. So, all right, well, big big full circle conversation here. So, um, <clears throat> you guys have been asking me to come and do this for you know the last. Two weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. I saw I saw the movie on opening weekend, and Zach saw it a couple days later. So yeah, it's not like you guys have been banging down my door or anything. But um, I did tell you that uh, just to to hold off for just a hair, um, because I saw it on the fiftieth anniversary of the Sharon Tate murders. That's yeah. So um, I kind of in in some weird weird world where that actually is cool to me um that's why i did it and it was actually supposed to come out on that day and uh when sharon tate did I, i'm just spatting off random um random trivia at this point but anyways her her sister had requested that it not come out on that day and i was saying fuck it i'm going on that day so that's why i went on that day and then cool. the very next their sure. very next day i go to a uh, uh like a house party uh, like a day house party and guess what there is to drink r- right when i walk in the door whiskey sours bloody fucking mary's damn it <laughs> only bloody mary's and Would've i was been like so much better <laughs> if it was whiskey sour <laughs> this is like cliff fucking booth <laughs> do you have moccasins on uh man like moccasins aren't cool but no. he made them work man <laughs> I think that's I feel like that's only a thing you could have done in the sixties. Yeah. Like or if, to just be poor and make your own shoes. If I see a motherfucker walking around in moccasins, <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> Even Clark's. It's like that's that is like one degree away from being moccasins. What are you doing? Yep. Man, he pulled them off though. Mm-hmm. Well, I mm-hmm. mean, it's Brad Pitt. True. Yeah. Yeah, there's that. So I love uh, I was I was talking with our buddy Drew. Uh, Chad, you you know Drew Miller. The Bear um, Drew. The what? The Bear Drew? 
the bear drew yeah <laughs> is that what you call him oh yeah yeah <laughs> I, I didn't know that that's, that's a good nickname for him yeah it's the uh, best name because like it, it's completely unsuspecting he's i mean it, it, it's the bear drew he's not that big drew. he's not that scary but it's awesome sorry continue <laughs> No, um, he also saw the movie around the same time that you did, and we have been talking a little bit about it because he's not necessarily the biggest um, Tarantino fan. He doesn't like a lot of Tarantino movies for whatever reason, but he really, really liked this one from what yeah. it sounds like. And uh, he was he was mentioning that he really appreciated the the placement of the flamethrower in the first act, how it was just kind of mentioned as, Hey, this is a prop that he used in a movie. And then it shows him torching the Nazis. And you kind of think like, Oh, okay. That's the end of it for that. But then it comes around full circle in the end of the movie. (laughs) And that ends up being the weapon of choice. Whenever he's got Manson murderers running through his house. (laughs) (laughs) The fact that he was like, you know what I need to do? I need to go into the, the fucking I, I need to go into the shed and grab my my flamethrower. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> but they did they did set it up pretty well with the the training and everything. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. <laughs> I mean, like it's too hot. Yeah, and the guy's it's, like, it's a fucking flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> but but Drew actually uh, taught me a, a new term because he explained that that's a, that's a, a term in playwriting that's carried over in a movie called a Chekhov's gun where you introduce a weapon in the first act and then it comes around to be the murder weapon or whatever in the end. Oh, and nice. he, he, that was just another little nod to film history that Tarantino threw in there that just, it goes, it's so subtle, but it's so badass at the same time. It's like a, a perfect combination of the old and the new. Cause it was a fucking flamethrower, dude. That was badass. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah if if you forgot that you were watching a tarantino movie that scene reminded you like oh yeah okay i know where i'm at yeah i think um you know in conclusion or whatever for this film a good way to look back on it is it's a two and a half hour movie about actors that are just being outstanding actors and then 15 minutes of Tarantino gore. Yeah, but it's well deserved and it, it feels like it feels like it's it's authorized, if you will, because we're all well aware of the Manson family and what they did. And for it to kind of take a turn of they they got what was coming to them instead of they got away with these murders was was an awesome little twist. And that's just that's like so Tarantino to take a an event like that, much like he did with Inglorious Bastards. He took an event that we all know very well and just put a crazy little uh, spin on it, and it was just awesome to see on the screen. And and that brings us to you know kind of the the spin or the twist that he puts on this movie, and that the Manson family never make it to Sharon Tate's house, <laughs> so that leaves her alive. I think that's actually, you know, you were talking chat about how it was designed or originally set to be released on the anniversary of her death. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a touching tribute. Like, Hey, this is how her life should have been. Yeah. Right. You know, I think once, you know, she, she was upset. Um, I mean, there were, there were all sorts of, of things that came out around the time that they had started casting and around the time that they started shooting. And I think that, um, I, I think Tarantino actually spoke with her sister and was like, Hey, just so you know, and you can't tell anybody that's not going to happen. And I think that she was a lot cooler with it, but also didn't okay. like the, the, the date or whatever. Um, so they, they made the change there and then they, of course they made the huge change, but, um, I, I guess Inglorious Bastards was the, the one that was, that was, it was fictional, fictional history in a way. Uh, so you, you had real events, but you also had these fictional characters that were placed in 
to the the historical uh, the facts and those fictional characters altered the facts um I, I think that prepared us for what was going to happen in this. I did not see the ending completely derailing what actually happened in history, but yeah, there. Um, <clears throat> man, I mean, I, it, I, I feel like if there were, if there were real people that would have interjected, you just had a bunch of, a, a bunch of rich kids essentially that, never had to take care of themselves or never had to protect themselves in, in yeah. that situation. You've got the Folgers heiress. You've got yeah. um, Sharon Tate's ex-boyfriend, which is still kind of odd that he's, you know, Jay Bruce hanging out there at Polanski's house and Polanski's yeah. not there with, uh, I don't know, whatever. They're just yeah. friends. Sure. Um, but but if yeah, they... you got some famous rich kids that They're probably just all... don't know how to fight. Yeah, they're yeah. just partying. And, and then you, eight, you've eight got months those, pregnant, Sharon Tate. Those kids that that the only thing that they have is the family that they have fashioned for themselves in a way, or that they've attached themselves to. Uh, they're all homeless kids or druggies or uh, whatever they want to to cling to at that time. So yeah, that's um, that story makes sense, but this story also makes sense. And then, you know, the interjection of <laughs> them being like, you know, we should go after, we should go after him. And no idea that they were going to get their asses, well, beat, destroyed, uh, eaten. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that dog. <laughs> that dog is awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I think the, the bond between Cliff and his dog is just perfect. Like he, uh, every every little thing that he says, she's waiting for the next. She she's like, okay, well that's gonna come next. That's gonna. Uh, 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 that, mm. <laughs> it just just waiting for the food. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. I, every single word, every single movement that he does, man, that's awesome. Yeah. And then, like Brandon mentioned, the the flamethrower made a made an appearance early in the movie, and then it came back to be a big part in the end. Same with the dogs training in particular. We saw, in yes. the, you know, she's super, super well trained and obviously listens to every little thing he says. And then we kind of forget about it. And then he brings his dog over to his buddy's house to have one last drunk with his with his best friend, brother, whatever you want to call him. And boy, does does she come in to, to <laughs> save the day? on it. You hear the little and goddamn, she takes care of it. <laughs> What's funny is my dog's trained to to come with the little ch- ch- sound yeah, sure. when i do that she picks up her head and comes running to where i am she doesn't attack or anything like that i i tried it when i got home from that movie i was like all right let's see here <laughs> fucking get that stuffed animal sitting over there get it and she just looks at me like what the fuck i'm right here <laughs> <laughs> it'll take a while to break her of that habit then yeah i was like man maybe i got me a cool dog like in the movies but I've never taught Spartacus that command, so maybe I can reserve <laughs> that for attacking people. There you go. If you got a dog like Spartacus, you've got to have it attack people. <laughs> Come on now. It's funny. Um, but that, I mean, let's go ahead and go around and give it a grade, you know, uh, alpha, alpha grade, you know, like you would get in school. Because I think before we all agreed that uh, Pulp Fiction was the best, it was our A plus movie. So if that's the measuring stick, where does Once Upon a Time in Hollywood stack up? Do you have your um, Do you have your spreadsheet with all of the where everything fell in the actual uh, Turin tournament? I do not. Oh. Not not handy. No, I I should have printed that Unprepared. out again. But, I yeah. don't know why it's not on your fucking desktop. I don't know either, man. <laughs> We're not friends anymore. <laughs> I failed. Done. I'll Fail. see you guys later. Bye. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Uh- <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. Zach. Did uh, it, man. I, I guess this is an, an A, A minus maybe. I, I, it's definitely in the top five for me. Um, I think the only thing that beats it out for me is Inglorious Bastards. Um, Obviously, Pulp Fiction. I want to say Reservoir Dogs, but not. I think I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a little bit more entertaining. 
even though, you know, there's no real action until the end, much like Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, I, I want to say it's maybe top three or top four for me. So yeah, maybe A, A minus, something like that. It's it's damn good. I like it better than Kill Bill. I like it better than, of course, his shittier movies. So yeah, it's it's up there for me. Yeah, I I kind of agree. I think it's uh, A, A minus somewhere in there. It's not quite the best, but it's definitely better than the most. Yeah. Um, yeah, I put it right there behind probably Inglorious Bastards. Maybe right slightly ahead of Django. Yeah, sure. Chad? Chad? Mm. My turn, huh? Um, yeah, I think uh, if I were giving it a uh, like a letter grade, yeah, it's definitely in the in the A category. Um, I gave it an A category solely based on the slower parts that I was like, man, this is slow. This is this is slower than I want the movie to be. And then I was like, maybe I should stop complaining and pay attention to what is actually going on in the slower parts. And they built up to what I would kind of catalog, just wait until when it would actually make sense why he was putting it in. Because Quentin Tarantino has never been one for fluff. He's one, He's been one for way too much dialogue. He's been one for way too much tension and way too much buildup. But he's never been one to fill a scene. If if something is if, if a person comes on screen if a a product is is placed on screen if a f- fucking uh, nineteen what, like early eighties model two door Civic is on screen it's there for a reason everything that he did was for a reason in it and even the slow parts were still interesting at that point um so yeah I'm, I I would put I would put it in my top three. Uh, I can't say that it's better than... I definitely won't say that it's better than Pulp Fiction, just because it's going to be real hard to top that one. Um, but I will let it and Inglorious Bastards figure out which one it wants, which one want to be second and third. Um, the ending was just phenomenal. And uh, <clears throat> the writing of it, whatever liberties that he took to to take the story that far or to take the scene that far were just perfect and i don't know if they had alternate endings i don't know if they had alternate deaths or certain people were supposed to go so certain people were supposed to come whatever it's fucking brilliant so yeah it's it, it beat out a lot of others that were great movies to me yeah I think that's Tarantino. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I think that's Tarantino's only qualm is that he can be a little slow sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's always to build to something, but yeah, he, he can be slow. And this movie, I don't think it was ever boring necessarily, but there were some slow parts for sure. Which, you know, at the end of the day, the whole movie was a story about two guys doing stuff. And one of them's an actor and one of them's a washed up stuntman. So, I mean, it was all to build up to the alternate reality of the Manson family murders. So it was a good payoff. And along the way, I I was entertained by Cliff and what he was doing and just the the random shit that they got themselves into. But you're right. It he can be slow for sure. And this was a slower movie, but they all have their little slow parts, I think. And he's just building up to something when he does that. Yeah, there's there's always little lulls, but the, if you pay attention during the lulls, hell, some of the, some of the times those are the most important parts because they're building up to that last scene or they're building up to the most pivotal scene or um, <clears throat> this even the slow part where they're talking about the the guys over Green Hornet not wanting him to to work for him. That all built up to the the Bruce Lee scene. Uh, everything purpose yeah much like uh, the basement scene in glorious bastards the first time you watch that you're probably not thinking oh man what's what's gonna happen here because it's just drunk nazis (laughs) trying to have a a meeting and then this fucking nazi comes out of nowhere and, and knows all this stuff and just unravels everything 
and then it all makes sense. So I, I did watch an interview of, of him talking about that one. And he was like, should it go 45 minutes? Should it be 15 minutes? Should it be? Yeah, fuck it. Let's just, let's just keep it going and we'll keep it going until it's just super uncomfortable and we'll just make people uncomfortable with it. It, Okay, well, it, it's thirty-five minutes, so yeah, like it, it just goes on and on and on, but it it builds that tension, that, and that's a ballsy thing for a for a filmmaker to do, you know, a, a lot of films these days, Marvel films and all those films that are all always the box office hits, they don't keep you waiting for shit. They give you what you're there for, and <laughs> they give you so much of it that it co- starts coming out of your ears. Explosions. But, yeah, but Tarantino is not afraid to make you wait. <laughs> no. Death, and I think death proof is proof. <laughs> I, well, I think I think I think Sharon Tate's role in this movie is proof that he he's constantly trying to build tension. Every scene that she was in, you were just uh, oh man, like oh she's so fun, so happy. Yeah. I mm-hmm. don't want I don't want to see what's coming. Yeah. The the fact that he portrayed her as such a happy cheerful young girl um uh what's her name Mar- Mar- margot robbie yes she Close she enough. did a fantastic job yeah you know like when she when she went to the movies to see her own movie <laughs> and she was like that's me i'm in the film you know like <laughs> she was just like so- mm, prove it <laughs> yeah like i don't know but of course you know then we got to see her dirty feet at the theater Oh, but you know, typical Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. um, but even that scene was for a reason to make you like her. She's just she. Yeah, she's a celebrity. Yeah, she's in movies, but she's still like awestruck by just being in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And the as as the movie viewer, we all liked her. Like we didn't want to see her get slaughtered in the end. Yeah, I think. And, the buildup for that was perfect because you they followed along her they followed her along in that day for half of the movie i mean the the whole second half of the movie they were following her around through what she was doing that day and everything was so fucking cute everything everything she did was just super innocent nothing you know it would to, to know what happens to them um and and to go into the movie and be like fuck, and then you see her do the next cute thing, and you're like fuck, <laughs> and then the next, like uh, it, it 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 would have been heartbreaking. Yeah, would've right. Been. Yeah, right. That and it that's what makes me kind of want to see a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood too, so that we can just continue seeing her being so goddamn cute. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that was a totally different role for her. Because yeah. you know, she, usually she's sassy as hell. She, or, yeah, she was Harley Quinn. Yeah, she was uh, the the Wolf rich heiress Street. in Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. The the Duchess of whatever mm-hmm. Staten Island, I think is what he calls her. Which I mean, how how good is her life? She gets to star in movies with Leo and Brad, and you know she was in Le- uh, Wolf of Wall Street with Leo and Matthew McConaughey and. She's she's knocking it out of the park with big name actors. Yeah, she's killing it. Do you think uh so Tarantino- was Sharon Tate? That's true. That's true. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Zach. What were you saying, buddy? Uh do you think Tarantino will bring her back for what what could be his last movie? I mean, she's in the universe now, so Yeah. He, he does like to use actors at least a couple times in his movies. Yeah. That, and, like the little cameo of uh, Michael Madsen that showed up in there. And um, hell, now he's pulling from the other generations, man, with uh, uh, Maya Hawk, uh, U- Uma's daughter. That's awesome. Yep. That, they started movies before she was even born. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, he, he's got his, his little Hollywood crew that he has that they're like, hey, we're Tarantino people. Mm-hmm. And he just rolls with that. And some of the actors that are in that Tarantino universe are some of my favorites and some of what a lot of people would consider the best. You know, <laughs> your Samuel L. Jackson's, your Leonardo DiCaprio's, your Brad Pitt's, your Uma Thurman's, a lot of big name movie stars that do a lot of Tarantino stuff. So, yeah, and they do good shit, you know. 
a lot of actors will settle for for whatever, but I mean, Brad Pitt, Leo, they have legendary roles that people love. So, you know, and how easy would it have been for somebody of Brad Pitt's caliber to be like, "Yeah, I'm not playing second fiddle." All right. I'm not going to come in and be a the 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 bullshit stunt man of the main character of your movie. No, like that that ain't me. I'm a but, lead. But you know that Tarantino would, would be like, no, 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 Brad. Here's the thing. Here, the thing. The thing is, <laughs> you control every fucking scene you're in, and yeah. you get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. I like. Out of all the the roles in this movie, I could see that one being the hardest to talk someone into playing. But Brad Pitt was probably the first person to sign up for any role that Tarantino wanted to give him. Yeah, I could see him being more. Um, I, I could see Brad Pitt being the person that was uh, that, that read the script and was like. Yeah, actually, it probably did go that way. He probably read the script and he was like, I think you could play cliff or Brad Pitt read the script and said, I should play cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it probably would have been that, but any other actor would have read it and been like, mm, Oh wait, I get to act as an actor, as a character, as an actor. I want to do that one. To Yeah. Do like I don't see Matt Damon choosing to be cliff booth. No, you know what I'm saying? So it is what it is. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts? Any any lasting uh, impressions that you want to leave our listeners with about Once Upon a Time? Zach, you can go first, buddy. Uh, it, I mean, keep on interrupting, Zach. If you're if you're a Tarantino fan, do not skip this one, especially if you're a fan of <clears throat> of like Reservoir Dogs, which I know a lot of people don't like, <laughs> Brandon. A lot of people. It's just one person. Just I've never me. heard anyone say they don't like it other than Brandon. Fair. But like if you're if you're a fan of the the build up, I love Tarantino's build up and his just he gets deep into the roots of of his stories and he 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 explores this ridiculous shit. Like in Pulp Fiction when when uh Vincent Vega and Jules are are going to the apartment and they stop and they have this conversation about foot rubs. I mean, that's just completely unnecessary, but Tarantino gives you these little bits and pieces that just make the the story amazing. And he he does this with the obviously main two people in the movie. Everyone else is just a sidebar and he just lets these characters build and build and build. And I just I love the universes that he creates. So highly recommend it. Um, yeah, it's it's great. It's for sure well worth a watch. It was completely necessary, Zach. Well, foot rubs are necessary, Zach. Touche. At least knowing where you stand with foot rubs is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> True. Or other people supplying said <laughs> foot rubs. <laughs> It's yeah. completely necessary. You don't want to get thrown out of a window for that shit. I don't. That's true. Before Chad? I supply my recommendation or last thoughts, I will say I'll give you a theory. I So the movie Drive, all three of us have seen that, right? Drive? Yeah. I don't think so. Oh, man. Out of this list. This theory may not be holding much water. Uh, Brewer, you got you, you seen it? I've seen it, yeah. All right, good. So in Drive, you don't know the name of the main character. You don't know if his last name is Booth. But it very well fucking could be somebody's son. Just saying. Drive is with uh, Ryan Gosling? You got it. Okay. I yeah. know a movie, but I haven't seen it. So it's good? Oh, it's Oh, it's brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. The, the yeah. director and his name is is fleeting. I I can't remember the director's name, but it's not the first time that he has made a movie where the main uh, the the actor uh, or or main rather has like less than a hundred lines. Oh wow! Yeah, he doesn't talk much. Uh, Nicholas Reffin. Yep. 
Yeah, because he did a uh, what's the other one? Val Valhalla or something? Um, not Valhalla. Uh, the the one with. It, are, do you have IMDb up right now? Yep. I don't have. Yeah, Valhalla Rising. Yep, that one. Uh, he he doesn't talk at all in that. Anyways, I'm just uh, I'm kind of throwing out a, a f- funny theory that I believe he could definitely be his child, based on the time frame. I mean, it would work. Yeah. Well, he's just as fucking violent, if not worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, Anyways. a little bastard child somewhere. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. You know, running around. Uh, yeah, I'll roll with it. Being a stunt <laughs> man. Stunt I'll driver. roll with it. I'm cool yeah. with it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I would recommend anyone that has enjoyed any of Quentin Tarantino's movies to go and see this because there are elements of every movie that he has ever done in this. Um, there, the character development, uh, the extended dialogues, the tension building, um, also the f- factual references and he always, he, he appreciates old film and uses references so well. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan. I don't necessarily drink the Kool-Aid and say that every movie of his is the absolute best movie in the world, but he pays homage to so many directors from before, even name drops in a few of these with like Sergio Leone and, uh, <laughs> uses some of his own, I, I think does he say that one movie was done by Antonio Margaretti? Yes, as well with he does. The, 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 the name from Inglorious Bastards and when, then the real when, life. When when it popped up on the screen, my wife leaned in and says, Margaretti. <laughs> I, looked, <laughs> I, I, I leaned over and I was like, Margaretti. <laughs> Gorlami. Like I said, third best. <laughs> yeah. Quasi. Yeah, so it's... uh. It's great. I, I think that um, if if I haven't completely ruined it for everyone, that they should go and watch it. And tell me what you think about Bruce Lee's char- uh, character or portrayal. Yeah, Funny. see, that's, that's the great thing is even with the spoilers that we gave, mm-hmm. there's still so much more to go and uncover for yourself. Oh, yeah. I've forgotten half the shit that happened in that movie. God, that, uh, that fucking flying kick. From the what is it, Enter the Dragon uh poster, the the movie cover where he's like doing the flying kick and and how he uses that to <laughs> he just sling him into a fucking car. <laughs> oh, if you I just think like imagine trying to do that in a real fight. Like that's what someone is really going to do to you. And that's that's probably what Quentin Tarantino was thinking. And he was like, yeah. If a real person who really gets their ass beat all day long or, you know, fights back or actually does fight were to fight him, they would probably just grab his leg and throw him into a fucking car or a wall. Yeah. Sure. And plus, Bruce Lee was a tiny little dude. So yeah, buck 20, buck 30. Right. But it's, it's funny that that is the that's the scene that's gotten the most flack out of the movie. Like, as you alluded to, Bruce Lee's daughter fucking hated the fact that that's how they portrayed Bruce Lee, but well, you know the, it, how much money Quentin Tarantino made off of that? A lot, at, at least twenty dollars from Bruce Lee's daughter. So there's that. Yes, there you go. <laughs> at the end of and, the day, you I bought mean, a ticket. Come on, in, in a movie where you know we're rewriting the history of Sharon Tate's murder, mm-hmm. if if Bruce Lee's legacy has to take. A, a minuscule hit to his reputation, mm-hmm. so be it. Hollywood. Let let Sharon Tate live. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think they they said that on. Uh, I think uh, Rogan's guest said that on the episode where they were talking about the movie. When's the last fucking time anyone talked about Bruce Lee? You know, so it, it he's he's somehow back in the in the the talk of of moviegoers for right. The next three months that this movie is relevant so fucking just chill out i can't wait for this movie to come out on uh dvd or blu-ray or whatever so that i can watch it at home mm-hmm. and and enjoy it you know to where i can rewind it and catch some of these quotable scenes because i mean there's so so many funny things so laugh out loud comedy in tarantino movies where it's 
you know, sometimes better than going to a comedy movie. Mm -hmm. I was gut laughing while people were getting their face smashed into glass. So, (laughs) I mean, that whole scene was just brilliant. (laughs) You're getting the face smashed against the, uh, the hearth of the the fireplace, <laughs> the flamethrower, the dog biting the crotch. Oh man, that flamethrower was insane! And then <laughs> she falls into the uh, the pool. Jesus, <laughs> she was done for at that point. Just, <laughs> but him just scampering off to the shed to grab the flamethrower. Oh man. Well, and I mean, we didn't even talk about this, but. Tarantino as a director just insisting to to shoot the movie on film mm-hmm. and it's intended to be seen in 35 millimeter yeah it's intended to be seen you know the old school way to go and see it I, and I wonder what the big difference is because I saw it on a digital projection mm-hmm. you know I, I went to a, a modern theater and saw it there but I wonder what the big difference would be in seeing it the way that it's supposed to be it would probably just give a bigger feel to the 1960s era. Yeah, more grainy image and stuff, yeah. I saw the Tarantino uh, Roadshow for Hateful Eight, and I watched it on 35 millimeter, and I didn't notice a bit of a difference. I hate to say it, but I, did, I didn't notice. Well, wasn't that one filmed on 70 millimeter because it was more focused on the mountain cinematography and stuff? Oh, it may have been whatever. I, th- I think he filmed it more on a on a much faster, um, whatever. Yeah, I've I've got the booklet somewhere that uh, I I kept the little like fancy booklet, the limited edition bullet, whatever that came with. If you went to one of those showings, and um and then this one I caught on like the fanciest, fanciest. I I've never seen a a movie at this theater before, but I was like, if I'm going, I'm going to go big. And it was like the big, I'm going to say big D and know what I'm saying, but know that you guys know what I'm saying. It's some kind of like fancy. There's like subwoofers in every seat. Sure. Nice. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wanted to see it in something big like that because it was, it was a new Terrence. You know, I have to step out of that old. <laughs> same theater, same theater, but a different. Wait, same place, different theater, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Well, well, it's like we alluded to earlier. Tarantino movies at this point are events. Oh yeah, you you mm-hmm. you plan it out. Like you know, you didn't go to opening night, but you had your event planned out for a specific reason. Uh, I went I opening remember... weekend, and Zach went. You know that next week so we were both planning to see it right away yeah. because it was an event we had to go and see it so Zach, this is the first one you've seen in the theater that's right yep yeah how about you brandon oh no i've seen several yeah i've seen you, several but you remember each one that you've seen and you remember the theater you went to for each of them don't you yeah yeah how fucking crazy is that uh, it's true it's you it's kind of like you remember where you were at 9 11 mm. <laughs> you remember where you were when you saw Kill Bill. <laughs> yeah. I remember going to um, Abingdon, Virginia, to watch Inglorious Bastards for the first time because they had the, the big sound there and no regrets. I'll make that hour drive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's my, my last take on it. It's a good movie. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Two thumbs up for me. Go see it. Uh, Chad, did you did you have video game shit you want to talk about? I know you mentioned that before we started recording. Yeah, sure. Um, what are you, what you playing? Uh, so recently, I bought a big fancy gaming monitor, and I'm actually going to be converting over to uh, to PC gaming here soon. Look at you! I know. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if I should congratulate you or boo you. Yeah, well, I, I've still got my. <laughs> currently, I have my Xbox One X into my fancy gaming monitor monitor and i'm actually i'm pleasantly surprised that the it it has actually gotten a lot better than me just using it on the big tv um you just sit a little closer but i've been playing uh apex a lot a whole lot and i still play a lot of overwatch 
Overwatch is still kind of my my thing. They're making a huge change to that this week, and it's gonna kind of take everybody back to zero. Cool. Yeah, uh, Overwatch is one of those games that it's it's fun, but it's very repetitious. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's hard to just sit down and be able to play online games constantly. I like to have a pause feature. Mm. You know, because whenever toddlers run in the room and say, Daddy, I need this. <laughs> yeah, that, they, I can they, see that being tough. They don't understand the, uh, hold on, Daddy's in an online ranked game. Like, <laughs> right. I, I don't care. I, I can't change your dirty pants right now. Sorry you pissed them. <laughs> I can see that being tough. I've never actually factored that. Never. That, yeah, I mean, that we tried to play uh, Red Dead online whenever we were actively reviewing that for the podcast and going through you know playing all the story missions and stuff the story was fine because i could be playing and then if something came up i could pause it go handle it and come back but the online play i just had to hop on the back of someone else's horse and hope they didn't die (laughs) (laughs) are you looking at any games coming out uh, later this year or anytime oh yeah yeah, the the sequel to the greatest sequel ever made, um, Borderlands Three. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely we, on our top list of games. Yeah, yeah we're looking pre-ordered well. and already it it's you know every time I log into my Xbox, it has a little icon of it being ready to download, and I'm like, stop toying with my emotions. <laughs> I wish you were getting it on PlayStation so that you could jump in the, the little party with me and Zach and Garth. Yeah, I, I could. I mean, I, I'll go out and buy it in PlayStation to play with you guys. I don't care. It's, it's fucking worth it, man. I'm telling you, there are yeah. some amazing, amazing exclusives on PlayStation 4. Yeah, I've got... I, I bought the $100 version for, for Xbox, and... Um, I think I have the same version for both Xbox and PlayStation for, uh, for number, number two. So, and I have like OP, I, I've done it all on both accounts basically. Sure. And for me to go back to that, wouldn't be anything crazy. I mean, I could, I could jump on and play with you guys. I don't know about playing with Garth. Garth pisses me off. I'm kidding. <laughs> <Totally joking. laughs> yeah. Yeah, why not? Uh, I'm assuming you were a big fan of of Call of Duty back in its heyday, Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare Two. Yeah, um, Modern Warfare was really good. Um, <clears throat> two was really good. We we played a lot of we played a lot of the multiplayer. Um, the story modes always felt like they went like I could finish a story mode in a night or something like that. Um, and there were always four levels or five levels of difficulty. And I always played on like the one below the hardest one. And it was still uh, always so fast. Um, they're bringing out a newer one soon, right? Yeah. Like a, a total revamp of the, of the series. Yeah. It's, it's as far as I know, uh, I guess almost a retelling of modern warfare. Um, and from what I've seen, the the gameplay looks fucking phenomenal. It's it's basically what we've all been waiting for from a Call of Duty game. It's going back to its roots, and it looks fucking outstanding. I'm super, super excited for it. Um, they've yeah. got some interesting modes that Call of Duty hasn't really explored before. They've got, like, real huge 64-player stuff going on. Um, They've got like this two v two thing that's supposed to be kind of cool. It's supposed to be like kind of esportsy. Mm. Uh, they've got like this um, this night mode or whatever where uh, basically you have to use night vision and a bunch of other things come into play. But yeah, kill, kill like your heads up display and stuff. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, I, I'm finally excited for a Call of Duty game again. So it's been forever since those <laughs> words have been uttered. <laughs> well, yeah. as as soon as a game starts being like, yeah, you get a, uh, you know, we ran out of good ideas for for realistic guns. You want a jetpack? You got a fucking jetpack. You want rocket skates? You got rocket skates. <laughs> you want some magnetic handles that you can throw up on a wall? Uh, we know it's not metal, but you can hang on it. Like. Yeah. 
just dumb, dumb. And I think, you know, they did it for, what, two or three different games? At least. It started yeah. with, I guess, Advanced Warfare was that first one that had exosuits and you could fucking climb yeah. on walls and whatever. Yeah. Give me, give me a gun. Tell me, uh, point in the direction of the heads that I need to shoot and I will shoot them. Make it fun. Make it look good. Yeah. I saw a little bit of Shroud's gameplay of the new one and it looked uh, quick, which is fun. I, I, I don't like if I get killed that I have to sit around for six minutes waiting for the rest of the team to die or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I like being able to go back and knowing where that guy is, I want to go and shit on him. Yep. Yeah. Tea bag him. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are you guys, um, uh, Brandon, you playing any one player games right now? Uh, the only game that I've really been playing lately has been Borderlands 2. Just been running through that again with uh, Zach and Garth. Yeah. But I I checked out Madden 20 last weekend. I played that for a little while. Mm. Spoiler alert, it's trash. Yeah, it's not that great. Um, we we kind of reviewed that on our previous episode of the podcast, so That's not going to yeah. beat a dead horse, but <laughs> we, we weren't too impressed. Yeah, same for me. I uh, I play a little PC games myself. Uh, I've got a buddy at work that we play together sometimes, um, and I recently picked up Squad, if you have ever heard of that. Mm-mm. Like a realistic shooter game. Okay. Uh, it's definitely not like Call of Duty. You you die very quickly. Um, but it's fun. Uh, I've been playing a little bit of that. Yeah, like Brandon playing ba- uh, Borderlands. Somehow I missed that entire series. Uh, I don't know how, but I oh, never... wait. So you're you're fresh to the whole storyline? Yeah, yeah. I, I picked up Handsome Collection, which yeah. is two and pre sequel. Mm-hmm. We've been playing through those, and yeah, they're fucking phenomenal. I love them. Did you? So you never played the first one, and you still haven't? Correct. Oh wow! All right. Oh, the only thing that you're really missing from the first one—the first one had a good story—but the only thing you're really missing from the first one is the word revolvers. Hmm. Okay. Um, because they they took revolvers and repeaters and put them together and made pistols for two. Uh, unfortunately, because revolvers were the jam for number one. Nice. Um, you could have like a a revolver that was level thirty and still be running around just bodying people at like level fifty. <laughs> like you get one of the. Uh, what was it? Corrosive revolvers and just destroy people 20 levels later is awesome. absurd. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to see what they're going to do for number three. Yeah. Yeah. Three should be, should be just completely off the wall. I've, I've seen a little footage of that gun that has legs and runs around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, the last game that I'm excited for, uh, that I think we'll all enjoy. And I know Garth is insanely excited for is, uh, cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. That no, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. I, bet, that, I, I hope that Keanu Reeves has something in his contract to be able to like have a full-on John Wick skit. Oh, man. <laughs> going through there. Be like, what I always wanted to do was this, and I could never do it in real life because we couldn't pull it off. <laughs> and they just, yeah, give him cybernetic arms and shit. They need to give him like a cyborg dog or something. <laughs> Somebody hacks his dog and he gets pissed oh. off and goes and kills everybody. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think I, I know I know Borderlands three announced that they're going to have the goodest dog that you can yeah. pet. Man, I saw <laughs> I saw that new guy that they introduced. Um uh, they did like the little introduction or backstory on him or whatever, the the flack guy. He's mm-hmm. gonna be fun. Good luck being able to play him because I'm gonna play the shit out of him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll be it'll be cool. Um, I I don't know all of the playable characters yet, so that's something that I'm looking forward to finding out over the next few months. Mm-hmm. And what is it, September, October? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very out? soon. It's next month, so, I think. Yeah, we're not far away now, so it'll be something that we're going to be talking about I quite a bit. Buy a so damn if... PlayStation and a PC. Stop it. Uh, I right. mean, d- don't make us. You know, don't you let got us twist PC. your arm, but. Yeah, no, I doubt. <laughs> I may go back. We'll see. You already got the PC, and you've already pre-ordered. No, it's coming. It on Xbox, I just have so. a an ex- I have a monitor that's the same price as a PC. That's what I was saying. Okay, 
Gotcha. Yeah, I was dumb. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was great, but it was dumb. Can't take your money with you when you die. <laughs> Yolo, as the kids say. Yeah, that's it. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, Chad, you got anything else that's going on that you want to talk about? No, uh, not really, man. I think um, you know. Next time we want to get together and do. Uh, we're oh shit! Have you guys watched The Boys? Nope. Nope. You're playing yourself. You guys have Amazon Prime? I do. Yeah. Well, that, that's the next thing that we need to do. Uh, I mean, I watched all of them in like a 36, 48 hour period. Um, you know, Brandon, you and I had kind of spitballed the idea of doing a, uh, like a good villains podcast and talking about like who the, you know, who the best villain of whatever, mm -hmm. whatever area is. Um, man. Uh, all the best villains are on the boys and they're all superheroes. Okay. Oh, I'll yeah. Add a list of shit I need to watch then. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it killer. If you, how many seasons? <clears throat> one season, it just started. One. Yeah. And Amazon's bankroll in it. So uh, the special effects are killer. Um, the casting, the, there's no huge names, a bunch of mid-level actors. Um, some of some of the people like Carl Urban's in it. He's about the only person that you're going to recognize. Um, if you recognize any of the others, good for you. I didn't. And so the exact opposite of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, pretty uh, much. Full of CGI, not really known actors. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but it's it's great. Um, if you if you're into you know superhero stuff, that's um, it's a big change of pace. And don't read anything into it. Don't if you've watched the trailer, cool, do it. If you need to watch a trailer, cool, do it. But don't look into it because it'll get ruined real quick. A lot of people cool. are talking about it online and spoiling it. Cool. Well, maybe we'll check that out and then drag you back on our show. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'd be happy to for sure. Yeah, cool, man. Always fun, man. Always, always a good time hanging out with you guys. Always cool to to chit chat with you guys. We'll. Do this again in three years when he brings out his tenth one or five years or whatever. No, I'm sure we'll get a, get you on here sooner than that. Yeah, um, we appreciate you coming on, buddy. Thanks again. Anytime, uh, fellas. For our listeners out there that are listening, we do a normal sports recap episode every Friday night, so please feel free to tune in for that. We like to talk a little bit about Red Sox baseball, Cardinals baseball. And we've been talking a lot about football lately with the NFL season about to ramp up. So check us out on our uh, regular scheduled podcast. And again, thanks for Chad for coming on. And Zach, you got anything else to add? That's it. All right, guys. Peace. Stay connected with Brandon and Zach on Facebook and Instagram at The Mess Podcast. And tune in next week for a brand new episode. And thanks for listening.